This video is going to cover Bradford Hill criteria, which are nine ideas that uh, so basically someone named Bradford Hill came up with that can help establish causal inference with observational studies. So this is uh, this is Bradford Hill. Um, I, I actually I don't know if those are both his last name. I'm I'm not too sure, or if his first name is Bradford. Um, but yeah, so he came up with this idea um, where there's nine criteria that will likely be true if uh, an exposure and outcome are causally related. Um, and I guess it's it's kind of overcoming the idea that association isn't causation. And in an experimental setting, it's easy to, to make it so nothing can change except what you're interested in. And you can be fairly certain that whatever phenomena you observe is due to the one thing you allowed to change. Uh, but with observational studies, we, you're not that lucky. You're, you're kind of always a little uncertain whether what, you're, what phenomena you're observing is due to the exposure you think is causing it. Um, so this guy came up with nine criteria that can help define something as, as likely a causal relationship. Although there's nine things, it's not a checklist. And even even I, I'm not sure if he argued against the term criteria, but the terms criteria is generally argued against because the way you're supposed to use them is um, basically taking them as a continuum that you, like ideally you're trying to find as many uh, sources of potential uh, or as many sources of support for a causal association. Um, so not discounting the ones that, the, that don't meet, or sorry, not discounting the criteria that your association aren't meeting, but also looking at all of the ones that it does meet and using all of that to come to a consensus rather than saying like, oh, it meets three of the five. And that brings me to my next thing is they're not all equal. Um, I'd say there's four great ones and five all right ones, borderline useless ones. Um, but four of them are excellent and commonly used in epidemiology. And some of these five are pretty good, but some of them are not good at all. And uh, we'll talk about some of the holes in them. So strength of association is the main one. Um, I'm going to do a video on um, measures of association and measures of effect in general. Um, but that'll kind of become clear in my example where uh, the larger the magnitude of a uh, measure of effect, um, the more likely it is causal, where a measure of effect is something like an odds ratio or a relative risk. It's, it's talking about how much more likely you are to get the disease if you're exposed. And um, just because an odds ratio is, is large, like an odds ratio of five would mean um, that someone is five times more likely to get the, the disease if they're exposed. That doesn't necessarily mean it's causal, and also if it's really small, like an odds ratio of, of like 1.2, which means you're like 20% more likely uh, to get the disease if you're exposed, that doesn't necessarily mean it's non-causal. You can have a small measure of effect, but a real causal relationship. Um, but if uh, you're unsure of the association and you have a very large strength of association, that's an indicate that's some support that it might be causal. Um, so just to illustrate that, an odds ratio, if it's less than one, it means um, the exposure is protective. You're less likely to, to get the disease if you're exposed. If it's above one, then it's um, you're more likely to get the disease. Um, and if we have this value here of like like 1.5, and this like line here is representing like the uncertainty or variability in that estimate, um, that variability is covering one, which is this null value. When an odds ratio is one, it means you're as likely to get the disease if you're exposed or not. Um, so it means there's no association. Um, but with a small measure of effect, that is still m far within the realm of possibility that this odds ratio is, is one or there's no effect. But if we had a much larger effect, a much larger odds ratio, then even accounting for this variability and uncertainty, like we, we see that it's 2.5, but we're, we're, we think like it might be as low as, as like 1.75. That's still an association. So that's how a large measure of effect can provide some support for causation. Uh, just, this is a table where sunburn is kind of going to be like the, what I'm going to use to illustrate each of these. So, um, 
we have a two by two here. We have people who got more than five hours of sun and people who got uh, five hours or less in the sun. And we have those who got a sunburn and those who didn't. So with a strong association, we have an odds ratio of, will we find the odds in the those who had high sun exposure, so 50 over 15, and divide that by the odds in the low exposure, so 15 over 50. And we see that um, if you got more than five hours of sun, you're 11 times more likely to have gotten a sunburn. That's some good support of a causal relationship where this um, weaker association comes out to 1.4, so you're only 40% more likely to get a sunburn if you uh, had more than five hours of sun. That would, be, that would not necessarily um, mean there's no causal relationship, but that would provide a little less support if we're, uns if we're unsure of whether it's causal. The next one is consistency. That's a pretty good one as well. In addition, oh yeah, the last one, strength of association. I, I don't know if I said it explicitly, but that's a that's a pretty good that's a pretty good one. Consistency is also a good one. Um, that's when similar associations are found across several studies. Um, so here, I'm just I have four hypothetical odds ratios from four separate studies investigating exposure and sunburn, or sun exposure and sunburn. And although there's some variability in the results, they're all around 2.5. And the fact that multiple studies that are um, taking these measures on different populations with different sample sizes at different times um, that in different geographic regions, it's, it's basically taken together, providing some really good support that um, these two things are related. Maybe not causally, but there's, we're getting there if we have both of these two that I've talked about so far met. Um, temporality is a great one. Temporality is probably the one of the most important ones, um, and that's if you can establish that exposure is preceding um, the disease, because uh, there's this issue of reverse causality when, when two things are occurring at the same time. Uh, like, let's just say we, we measured, we went to the beach and we measured um, who's in the sun and who has a sunburn. We, we don't know that the sun came first. They might have arrived at the beach with a sunburn. Um, so that's basically what cohort studies bring to the table is that with a cohort study you, you establish this group of people that don't have a sunburn you follow them over time and you see um, who gets a sunburn and then you can be certain that uh, you can be certain that it came second basically that uh, the disease came second so how I'm representing this is we have four people with no sunburn at the start and they are being followed for a number of hours uh, and we have everyone who knows sunburn at the start and after hour one uh, still no one has a sunburn and they're all being exposed to high UV sunlight over this time after two hours one person got a sunburn that's what that red dot is after three hours another person did and after four hours when we stopped following them uh, one other person got a sunburn but this person didn't um, we we know that these people, um, the sunburn came second after exposure to light. So that's a pretty good indication that there's a temporal relationship here, which also supports causality. Dose response is um, the last of the really good ones that I'm going to talk about. And that's that is the intensity or dose of the exposure increases. So does the intensity of disease. And that doesn't apply to every disease. Some diseases are like categorical, you have it or you don't. But as far as ones that have severity, sunburn's kind of one of them for sure. Um, we have just uh, as the UV index increases, does sunburn severity increase? And that can be measured as um, like the surface area with which you're, you're covered in a sunburn or the like redness, the degree of peeling or blistering. Like that, these are all things you could probably do to measure sunburn intensity um, but the one problem we can run in with this one is it's not always so simple as, as this you can get weird relationships where it starts off kind of like um, not intense gets really intense then all of a sudden it, it's not as bad anymore it can have multiple peaks and valleys uh, I can't think of an example of things like that nutrition is a common one with like um, like there's certain vitamins that you need some of it or you need some some uh, nutrients but you can also have too much of it and it starts to having not enough is bad but also having too much is, is also bad uh, plausibility is an all right one um, 
does the association make biological sense? Um, so, like, each, if each of these things have been researched independently, that, like, uh, the sun causes UV radiation, or sun releases UV radiation, and UV radiation leads to damaged um, skin cell DNA, and whether we know that this is directly causing inflammation or we, we know from other kinds of, like, damage to DNA that it can cause inflammation, just basically this, like, sequence of events doesn't make biological sense. That's um, an important part. But at the same time, if we rely too heavily on this, then nothing new would ever be learned because whenever anything groundbreaking is discovered, it, it obviously is either... Um, Brand, it's either like brand new information that has nothing to support it or it might go against what we think we know. Um, so this one has some problems, but it doesn't hurt if it's biologically plausible. Experimental evidence is another one that's all right when it's possible, but there's a lot of situations that are unethical. Like if we're, if we're no, if we think something's harmful, like smoking, we can't assign smoking. Or in the example I'm about to give, we can't assign someone to get a sunburn if we think they're we can't willingly put them in a scenario where they're likely to get a sunburn. And there's some things that it's not necessarily that it's unethical to assign, it's that it's physically impossible, like you can't assign race or sex. Um, so yeah, this is, this is the what I was just talking about, where we have like five hours of high UV exposure versus staying inside and randomly assigning that. Um, in this way, we, we could experimentally like figure out uh, or at least provide some pretty compelling evidence that it's the UV exposure that's causing sunburn, if we were to compare sunburn in these two groups. Specificity is probably the worst one, uh, the most controversial one. It's um, that one, the exposure leads to one outcome, which is problematic. For example, like smoking, it's like pretty obvious that that's causing lung cancer, but if we use specificity as a causal criteria, then we'd want to find out that smoking only causes um, lung cancer and nothing else, but it, it causes all kinds of things. Um, it's problematic even with our example where high UV sun exposure can lead to sunburn, but it can also lead to other things like heat stroke and dehydration. And as far as this causal criteria is concerned, that would be evidence against the fact that um, UV exposure is causing a sunburn. Coherence is not bad, um, it's, uh, but it's like not great either. Does the association fit with our existing literature? Uh, and that's slightly different from biological plausibility. Uh, so like if we, if we know that the sun emits UV radi radiation, we know that can cause tissue damage. Um, and we know that tissue damage can cause inflammation. Basically, it's, it, it jives with what we, what we already know. Um, I guess the biological plausibility one is more does the mechanism make sense like the actual like cascade of events I guess here it's more just like does it does it fit the puzzle of, of like what we what we know basically it, it does it does it align with that to be honest those two are very similar and I have trouble differentiating them sometime the plausibility and coherence um, analogy, again, is kind of similar, but a little easier to differentiate from the others. It's, uh, is the mechanism that we think is, is causing this uh, cascade of events? It, can we come up with analogies elsewhere? Some examples of that are the same exposure outcome relationship, so like UV, sun ex UV and sunburn in another species, like whether the, um, we have, we've observed that in another species, or if we've observed something with humans that has like a kind of comparable exposure outcome relationship. So I guess one here is that we know nuclear radi radiation can cause DNA damage and that can cause inflammation and, and lead to skin reddening and, and whatnot. And um, the mechanism is very similar with the sun, even though it's a different kind of radiation, it's still radiation cause of some kind causing DNA damage leading to inflammation. And in that sense, we have an analogous mechanism that we've already established if this is something new that we're studying. Um, so yeah, that's all of them. The Bradford Hill criteria are super useful and uh, helpful. Well, a lot of them are super useful and helpful to understand um, basically causality in general. Some of them are kind of outdated and you shouldn't really rely on any one. Uh, and ideally, you're 
like whenever you are if your career is based on establishing something basically you're like you're going to spend time going about these different avenues of causation to like oh we can establish a dose response we can um we can yeah we, we can establish temporality or, or stuff like that like you're, you're going to try and do a, a bunch um and yeah 